Delivering on its promise to transform our understanding of the early universe, the James Webb Space Telescope is probing galaxies near the dawn of time. One of these is the exceptionally luminous galaxy, which existed when the universe was just a tiny fraction of its current age. That means the light left the source long before even our Milky Way was here. How amazing is that? However, as the earliest and most distant galaxies ever seen, it is also one of the most enigmatic. Why is it so bright? That question has exacerbated the ongoing crisis in cosmology. Join us as we dig deep into how James Webb's newest discovery just shattered our cosmos. Humans have long found meaning in the stars, but only recently have we begun to understand whole clusters of them, galaxies, way out in the depths of space. A few nearby galaxies, such as Andromeda, have always been visible to the naked eye as a dusky smear in the night sky. Other shimmery structures became known to us after the invention of the telescope in the 17th century, along with a debate about their nature. Were they clouds of cosmic dust within our Milky Way, or island universes of their own? Not until the 1920s did humanity identify these glowing clouds as galaxies, when the astronomer Edwin Hubble, relying on the work of a lesser-known astronomer, Henrietta Leavitt, found that some stars were too far away to belong to the Milky Way. And only in the mid-1990s, when a space telescope named for Hubble peeked farther into the universe than ever before, did we find the thousands of galaxies shimmering across the universe, island after island in a vast cosmic sea. After Hubble, astronomers felt pretty confident that they understood galaxies and how nature makes them. But some new, startling developments have popped up, courtesy of a space telescope far more powerful than Hubble. The James Webb Space Telescope, in full operation since summer 2022, has shown that galaxies formed much sooner after the Big Bang than scientists previously thought, and that some of them are unexpectedly large, absolutely brimming with stars. The findings have thrown scientists into a new reality in which their existing theories no longer apply. Everyone in the astronomy community knew that the Webb Telescope was going to be revolutionary. As Joel Leija, an astronomer at Penn State University said, and we had a very clear list of things that we thought Webb would totally blow our socks off about. But the discovery of cosmically chunky galaxies where there shouldn't be any? This was nowhere on it. No one was looking for this. Those early results came about so quickly because researchers used a clever shortcut to estimate galactic distances. Astronomers usually pin down cosmic coordinates via precisely measuring redshift, a stretching of a galaxy's light toward the red end of the electromagnetic spectrum as a result of the universe's expansion. For example, a light bulb that emits pure violet light, if placed in a region of the cosmos roughly corresponding to a redshift of one as seen from Earth, would appear as deep red. By comparing the observed spectra from these galaxies with that of a source at rest, we can infer how fast the galaxies are receding from us, and hence how far away they are. If all cosmic history is a book, the redshift acts as the page numbers, indicating when something is happening in the story. Unfortunately, not all the chapters are visible to us. The cosmic dark ages make up the bulk of the book's missing pages. Imagine reading Shakespeare's Hamlet and skipping some initial scenes. You would transition from someone whispering in the darkness on the battlements of a castle in Denmark to a prince seeing ghosts and stabbing at tapestries. What happened? This is the situation that astronomers are facing. We now possess an excellent description of how it all started. The Big Bang Theory has successfully explained the features of our universe. Just a few numbers, called the cosmological parameters, can fully describe the universe's initial conditions, and decades of observations have confirmed with spectacular precision that cosmic history seems to have begun with a fiery expansion from a single, still mysterious, primordial point. But a shadow fell across the universe as matter cooled from its early incandescence, 
and relatively simple initial conditions advanced into intricate complexity. This is the source of the rift in cosmic history, the darkness where astronomers wander. What's certain is that a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, a blink of an eye in cosmological terms, the great shadow began to lift. Enormous clouds of gas collapsed, and stars perhaps hundreds of times heavier than our sun sparked a light, beginning a photonic deluge that, over eons, illuminated the universe. In this brief cosmic period, all the protagonists of our story, including black holes and galaxies, started to peek through from behind the dark curtain of the cosmic stage. The first stars were mostly made of hydrogen and helium, the lightest elements of the periodic table, as heavier elements did not yet exist. As they shined, these stars and their subsequent kin transmuted those light elements into heavier carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and other elements crucial to the universe as we know it today. These elements, these ashes from early stars, eventually formed everything we observe around us, you and me included. To fully appreciate this milestone in our chronicle of cosmic history, we must fill in the missing pages surrounding it. How did the first stars, black holes, and galaxies form? How big were they? How fast did they grow? And how was their evolution interconnected? How did the cosmic transition from simplicity to complexity lead to at least one world where curious creatures gaze up at the sky in wonder? Without such details from these few but fundamental chapters, our understanding of the universe and our place within it will be forever incomplete. This is the deepest, purest reason why astronomers are seeking sources farther and farther out. We are privileged to live in an era when telescopes of unprecedented power like the James Webb Space Telescope can aid us in this cosmic endeavor. Acting like time machine, more distant galaxies have since been discovered by James Webb that are invisible to Hubble's capabilities. Of the top 10 galaxies known at the end of 2023, nine of the top 10 spots are Webb galaxies, with GNZ 11, the sole confirmed galaxy, not requiring either discovery or confirmation with James Webb. A series of observations in October 2023 and January 2024 revealed a galaxy from less than 300 million years after the Big Bang, during a period known as Cosmic Dawn. Called Jades, GSZ-14-0, the collection of stars was spied as it was a mere 290 million years after the Big Bang. Put another way, if the universe is 13.8 billion years old, it means we're observing the galaxy when the cosmos was only 2% of its current age. GSZ-14-0 was discovered to have a redshift of 14.3, besting the 2022 record of a galaxy found with a redshift of 13.2 that corresponded to a formation age of some 325 million years after the Big Bang. Astronomers say the most interesting aspect of the latest observation is not so much the great distance involved, as amazing as that is, but rather the size and brightness of Jades, GSZ. Z-14-0. Webb measures the galaxy to be more than 1,600 light-years across. That is some five times more luminous than that prior most distant galaxy. That's why George Rieke, another University of Arizona astronomer who is the former deputy director of Stewart Observatory, said, Nobody dreamed that there would be galaxies this bright at this high redshift. According to NASA, Members of the Jades team explained recently that the light we see is coming mostly from young stars and not from a mission near a growing supermassive black hole. This much starlight implies that the galaxy is several hundreds of millions of times the mass of the sun. This raises the question, how can nature make such a bright, massive, and large galaxy in less than 300 million years? Thus, for a brief moment, this new reality seemed to threaten astronomers' fundamental understanding of the entire cosmos. If the starting point looked like that, could the standard model of cosmology, our strongest theory about the origins and composition of the universe, the one that didn't account for what Webb found, be wrong? For many astronomers, the answer is simply, 
yes. But for other, the crisis in cosmology is pure exaggeration. The possible explanations for how astronomers got it wrong are plentiful. Perhaps early stars formed far more efficiently than we thought through mechanisms that scientists hadn't considered before. Alison Kirkpatrick, an astronomer at the University of Kansas who studies galaxy evolution, wonders whether cosmic dust in these galaxies could be playing tricks on Webb, making stars appear older than they really are, and maybe cosmic dust was just different back then. Elsewhere, Ivo Labé, an astronomer at Swinburne University of Technology, suspects that black holes could play a role. They are among the most luminous objects in the universe when they're feeding on cosmic matter, which glows as it gets sucked in. If you dump a lot of gas into a black hole, it will start to outshine the entire galaxy. Such black holes could make early galaxies appear brighter, more star-filled. But none of these possibilities will undo the fact that the first island universes are not what we expected. Even accounting for some weird new phenomena, everything's too big, and it's too big, too soon. Investigating these questions will require more web observations, particularly the kind that yield more detailed measurements of starlight, known as spectroscopy. Astronomers need more to confirm that the most unusual galaxies they've found are the real deal. And if they really are as old and big as they seem, understanding their composition will help astronomers suss out the conditions in which they formed. Researchers are in the thick of it now, with fresh spectroscopic data expected to come this spring. The effort verges on soul-searching. Primordial starlight has never been so in demand, and astronomers and theorists, those who observe cosmic wonders and those who explain them respectively, don't know exactly what they'll find once they're finished. It's probably going to be something like five years until we've totally settled into our new universe that we've gotten from James Webb. So, in one sense, these new discoveries have injected drama, even anxiety, into a field that was quite stable. It's incredible how the universe is just so much weirder than we thought it was, Erica Nelson, an astronomer at the University of Colorado at Boulder, told me. But in another sense, it's just fun. It's the beginning of the universe, so it's really fun to think about this kind of stuff. In addition, peering deeply into the cosmos, NASA's James Webb Space Telescope is giving scientists their first detailed glimpse of supernovae from a time when our universe was just a small fraction of its current age. A team using Webb data has identified 10 times more supernovae in the early universe than were previously known. A few of the newfound exploding stars are the most distant examples of their type, including those used to measure the universe's expansion rate. To make these discoveries, the team analyzed imaging data obtained as part of the James Webb's JADES program. Webb is ideal for finding extremely distant supernovae because their light is stretched into longer wavelengths, a phenomenon known as cosmological redshift. Prior to Webb's launch, only a handful of supernovae had been found above a redshift of two, which corresponds to when the universe was only 3.3 billion years old, just 25% of its current age. The JD's sample contains many supernovae that exploded even further in the past, when the universe was less than 2 billion years old. Previously, researchers used NASA's Hubble Space Telescope to view supernovae from when the universe was in the young adult stage. With JADES, scientists are seeing supernovae when the universe was in its teens or preteens. In the future, they hope to look back to the toddler or infant phase of the universe. To discover the supernovae, the team compared multiple images taken up to one year apart and looked for sources that disappeared or appeared in those images. These objects that vary in observed brightness over time are called transients, and supernovae are a type of transient. In all, the Jade's Transient Survey Sample Team uncovered about 80 supernovae in a patch of sky, only about the thickness of a grain of rice held at arm's length. According to teammate Justin Purell, a NASA Einstein Fellow at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, this is really our first sample of what the high-redshift universe looks like for transient science. 
We are trying to identify whether distant supernovae are fundamentally different from, or very much like, what we see in the nearby universe. Purell and other Space Telescope Science Institute researchers provided expert analysis to determine which transients were actually supernovae and which were not, because often they looked very similar. The team identified a number of high redshift supernovae, including the farthest one ever spectroscopically confirmed, at a redshift of 3.6. Its progenitor star exploded when the universe was only 1.8 billion years old. It is a so-called core collapse supernova, an explosion of a massive star. Of particular interest to astrophysicists are Type 1a supernovae. These exploding stars are so predictably bright that they are used to measure far-off cosmic distances and help scientists to calculate the universe's expansion rate. The team identified at least one Type 1 a supernova at a redshift of 2.9. The light from this explosion began traveling to us 11.5 billion years ago when the universe was just 2.3 billion years old. The previous distance record for a spectroscopically confirmed Type 1 a supernova was a redshift of 1.95, when the universe was 3.4 billion years old. Scientists are eager to analyze Type 1 a supernovae at high redshifts to see if they all have the same intrinsic brightness, regardless of distance. This is critically important, because if their brightness varies with redshift, they would not be reliable markers for measuring the expansion rate of the universe. PRL analyzed this Type 1 a supernova found at redshift 2.9 to determine if its intrinsic brightness was different than expected. While this is just the first such object, the results indicate no evidence that Type 1 a brightness changes with redshift. More data is needed but for now, Type 1 a supernova based theories about the universe's expansion rate and its ultimate fate remain intact. Pierrel also presented his findings at the 244th meeting of the American Astronomical Society. The early universe was a very different place with extreme environments. Scientists expect to see ancient supernovae that come from stars that contain far fewer heavy chemical elements than stars like our Sun. Comparing these supernovae with those in the local universe will help astrophysicists understand star formation and supernova explosion mechanisms at these early times. As fellow Matthew Siebert of the Space Telescope Science Institute, who is leading the spectroscopic analysis of the JD's supernova, said, We're essentially opening a new window on the transient universe. Historically, whenever we've done that, we've found extremely exciting things things that we didn't expect. Otherwise, because Webb is so sensitive, it's finding supernovae and other transients almost everywhere it's pointed. So, this is the first significant step toward more extensive surveys of supernovae with Webb. Elsewhere, using the James Webb Space Telescope, astronomers have discovered the richest menu of hydrocarbons ever seen in a planet-forming disk. This observation, which involved the protoplanetary disk around a tiny star, also revealed the first detection of a Thane outside the solar system. The discovery was made when the Miri on James Webb investigated the object Isochai-147 as part of the Mid-Infrared Disk Survey, or MINES. Isochai-147 is a young star located in the Chameleon-1 star-forming region of around 237 stars. This region is located around 600 light-years away. These Webb's observations of ISO Chi 147 imply the protoplanetary disks of tiny stars are more efficient at forming smaller, Earth-like planets than they are at birthing vastly larger, Jupiter-like gas giants. Thus, as low-mass stars are more common than larger stars in the Milky Way, there may be more terrestrial planets in our galaxy than previously suspected. The findings also show that the planet-birthing clouds of gas and dust surrounding tiny stars are built differently, at least chemically, from those around stars about the size of the Sun and larger. 
the different chemical menu around these relatively small stars may mean their rocky planets have very different atmospheres than that of Earth. ISO Chi 147's mass is just over 10% that of the Sun, and it is surrounded by a protoplanetary disk with carbon-rich chemistry featuring 13 carbon-bearing molecules, including ethane and benzene. However, the abundance of oxygen-bearing molecules in this disk is very low. This is profoundly different from the composition we see in disks around solar-type stars, where oxygen-bearing molecules, such as water and carbon dioxide, dominate. The MINDS team thinks this shows the material is transported radially through the protoplanetary disk of ISO Chi-147, thus impacting the bulk composition of any planets forming within the disk. So, what does this mean for exoplanet hunting? First off, you should know that stars are born when massive clouds of gas and dust develop overly dense patches that eventually collapse under their own gravity. This process doesn't utilize all that material, however, which leads to infant stars being surrounded by swirling and flattened clouds of gas and dust called protoplanetary disks. When patches of matter in this disk condense, planets emerge. That's what happened around our infant sun around 4.6 billion years ago. The amount of material in a protoplanetary disk and how that gas and dust is distributed places a limit on how many planets a star can host, as well as what building blocks those planets can be supplied with. James Webb's ISO Ch147 results indicate this protoplanetary disk is better suited to birthing smaller rocky planets rather than larger gas giants. Because the environments in protoplanetary disks determine the conditions in which new planets form, the finding that disks surrounding very low-mass stars evolve differently than those around more massive stars has potential implications for finding rocky planets with Earth-like characteristics. However, tiny stars could host planets that are like Earth in many ways, but radically different in others. As Thomas Henning, MINDS team leader and a researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy, pointed out in the statement, many primary atmospheres of those planets will probably be dominated by hydrocarbon compounds and not so much by oxygen-rich gases such as water and carbon dioxide. We showed in an earlier study that the transport of carbon-rich gas into the zone where terrestrial planets usually form happens faster and is more efficient in those disks than the ones of more massive stars. The reason for the carbon and oxygen imbalance between protoplanetary disks of stars with different masses is not currently understood. For instance, it could be the result of disks around smaller stars being enriched with carbon or from them being depleted of oxygen. If the former is true, that would mean carbon enrichment can happen as solid particles in the disk are stripped of their carbon content. That content would be released as gas. These carbon-deprived solid particles would go on to form planets with rocky bodies that are carbon-poor. However, the atmospheres of these worlds would be carbon-dominated due to an excess of carbon gas in the environment in which they are born. Thus, these rocky planets around tiny stars would ultimately be carbon-rich and quite different from Earth. Research leader Aditya Arabhavi, also of the University of Groningen, added that these findings were made possible by the James Webb's unique position around a million miles, or 1.6 million kilometers, from Earth. In the words of Arab Havi, these observations are not possible from Earth because the relevant gas emissions are absorbed by its atmosphere. Previously, we could only identify acetylene emission from this object. However, James Webb's higher sensitivity and the spectral resolution of its instruments allowed us to detect weak emission from less abundant molecules. The MINDS crew now intends to investigate more protoplanetary disks around low-mass stars. This will help determine how common exotic, carbon-rich terrestrial planet-forming regions like that of ISO Chi 147 actually are. While James Webb is revolutionizing many areas in astronomy, from first galaxies to new worlds, its predecessor, the Hubble Space Telescope, continues to show signs of its advanced age. Late last month, 
the iconic observatory went into a protective, safe mode after detecting anomalous readings from a gyroscope, a device that helps mission team members point Hubble toward its cosmic targets. NASA officials announced last week that the misbehaving hardware is beyond repair, leaving Hubble with just two functioning gyros out of a total of six. As a result, the agency will shift the telescope into one gyro mode, keeping the other healthy one in reserve for future use. But don't panic. This doesn't mean the end is near for the orbiting observatory. Hubble has observed the universe for three decades now, and will continue to do so for years to come. Mark Clampen, director of the agency's Astrophysics Division and Science Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters, said during a press briefing this afternoon, Gyro issues have cropped up repeatedly for Hubble over the years. NASA astronauts replaced gyros multiple times on servicing missions to the observatory, five of which were performed between December 1993 and May 2009. The first servicing effort was the most critical, fixing Hubble's blurry vision, which was caused by a flawed primary mirror. Indeed, though Hubble holds just six gyros at a time, a total of 22 of the devices have found their way into the observatory over the decades thanks to the servicing missions. Nine of those 22 have now suffered failures. Hubble's pointing control system normally employs three gyros at a time, with three held in reserve. But there's margin built into that strategy. The observatory has previously operated in two gyro mode, for example, using other onboard sensors to substitute for the third device. According to NASA officials, one gyro mode is also an option, and the performance difference between it and two gyro mode is negligible. So it makes sense to control Hubble with just one gyro from here on out, saving the other one for future use. Hubble should be up and running in the new mode around mid-June, said Hubble project manager Patrick Krauss of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, who was also on today's call. The telescope should keep on going for a while after that, provided nothing unexpected crops up, he added. As Krauss said, we updated our reliability assessments for the gyros, assuming that this gyro is no longer useful to us, and we still come to the conclusion that there's a greater than 70% probability of operating at least one gyro through 2035, so we do not see Hubble as being on its last legs. That said, one gyro mode will impose some limitations on the Hubble team. For example, it will take longer to switch from one science target to the next, Krauss said, leading to perhaps a 12% reduction in scheduling efficiency. Hubble also won't have as much flexibility in terms of which parts of the sky it can observe at a particular time, he added, and the telescope will no longer be able to track moving targets that are closer to us than Mars is. Although those targets have been rare targets for Hubble over the years, Krauss said. The mid-2030s, by the way, could be the end of the line for Hubble no matter how long its remaining gyros last. That's the beginning of the window when drag could bring the telescope down to a fiery death in Earth's atmosphere. NASA has studied ways to stave off that fate, including a proposed private plan to boost Hubble's orbit via a crewed SpaceX Dragon mission, but there's nothing in the works at the moment. According to Clampen, after exploring the current commercial capabilities, we are not going to pursue a reboost right now. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.